Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Giluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello and welcome to Morobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. It's always a privilege and honor and a delight for me to welcome you to another episode of Morobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. We are celebrating our third year now in existence and it really helps us a lot if you just uh, smash that subscribe button. Please, before we do anything, smash that button. Another thing is that we welcome any opportunity to collaborate and to for sponsorship if you are inclined to be part of us, please get in touch with my PA. Uh, today we have uh, one of a kind. We have Tebo Hosebejo, businessman, entrepreneur, and a lawyer as well. Um, I'm so pleased to welcome you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. And good afternoon. Uh, yes, I always think about the time when you are a young man and uh, we work together at Leruma Mohobe, those days. Yeah, yeah very yeah. good times. Uh, yeah. yeah, Fantastic times from a law point of view. Yes, I think yes. that's the time when I was doing a lot of litigation. <laughs> yes, yes. I think that's when you cut your th teeth. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Could absolutely. you just um, uh, start with a short introduction about yourself? Um, my name is Atebo Kosebejo. A lot of people call me Mara. Uh, from the football circles, yeah, it's a name that, that I'm now accustomed to. Um, Mara, yes, okay. Um, it's got a history. <laughs> yes, we'll touch on it yes. later. Yeah. I'm I'm an attorney, um, based in Gaborone, working for a firm called Sebejo Attorneys. Um, but besides that, I'm also um, an investor in property development. I'm a developer. Um, to some extent, mm. and yes, I'm also a, a, a very uh, astute football administrator. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your professional training and background in terms of what, what you did and where you went. Um, it's always nicer to speak about my professional background um, by touching on my history as mm -hmm. a person. Mm -hmm. I am from a place called Old Naledi. And the working class side of uh, Khaboroni. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I was. Otherwise born. known as Takana. As otherwise known as Takana, or the Takana, as we call it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's where I was born and raised. Mm. Um, of course, I did a little bit of my school in Juaneng mm -hmm. after a nasty incident where I was supposed to go to um, Thornhill. Mm -hmm. I was admitted there, but the scholarship collapsed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, one of these underprivileged. Uh, you know, students mm -hmm. where they got a scholarship and you are admitted at uh, Thornhill. So mm -hmm. I was part of that, and it Thornhill collapsed. Thornhill is a very, it's a top uh, yeah. English medium school. Yes, yes, the, one, the it, oldest it, actually in, yeah, in Botswana. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. it never really got to happen that time. Mm. Uh, Why did it collapse? Because there was an accounting problem, mm. and uh, then we were told that uh, I can't go there. Mm. Uh, because because of that, the mm. sponsorship was discontinued. Yes. Yeah. So I had to move to join him because I couldn't take the abuse mm. <laughs> that I that I was subjected to by my colleagues in Old Naledi. The, the embarrassment. Yeah, yes. the embarrassment. You know, mm. Canada that, that that year, I, I remember telling them, "Oh, I'm not going to go to school and some of the schools are high alive and all those." And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then when it didn't happen, I had to go back, and yeah. it was really, really, really Rough. difficult. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's where I, I was born and raised. Um, I went to um, Sepa Piso for my secondary schooling, Form 1 to Form 5. Mm -hmm. um, and thereafter, I went to read law at the University of Botswana. Um, after reading law, I never wanted to be part of the um, public service, so mm. to speak. Mm. So I was very clear about where I wanted to go. So I joined briefly. Uh, Richard Lyons at tennis, but that was before my admission. Mm -hmm. Soon after, I became a lawyer, 
Um, I joined uh, the Remote Mobile Legal Practitioners. Uh, you're very astute for I really cut my, my <laughs> teeth as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, I know that... Uh, you're uh, an excellent pupil, by the way. Yes, yes. An yes. excellent person to work under. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I, I know to so work, To work with, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, quite often, if you recall, mm. I was in court every day. Uh, I was knocking off very late. Uh, most of the time, 11 o'clock, I'll be at the office. That's because I threw you into the deep yeah, end, you, and you, you also you also love the law. Yeah, yeah, I really, really love the law, and I was always in court. Mm. Uh, you know, I did preparations at night, sometimes early morning. I sacrificed a lot of my weekends, um, but the good thing is that. Uh, there was professional independence in the in the firm, mm. where you would be just given a file, and then you will run with it. Uh, you will make decisions and consult as and when you have a problem. So yeah, those were the the great moments where I really really um, got to to practice law in the real sense. Mm. But soon thereafter, I opened a firm called uh, the Bohose Boga Tennis uh, in January February two thousand and one. Um, yeah, so we were there also for about four years. Were, I, you, were you not with Colin Duncan at some point? Or no, no, you no. bought his practice? No, I bought his practice. Oh, yes, okay. Yes. Uh, he had left, so I bought his practice. So, um, yeah, so I ran with uh, the law firm Tobogo Sebogo Tennis. It was a, a very difficult phase also, mm. because at that point I literally bent myself out. Mm. Um, you know, I was very hungry. As a lawyer, I, I I did myself, and that 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 was right around the time when firms were young people could not open firms. Mm. It was no, normally it used to be a preserve for the older people, mm. uh, for the older lawyers. So because you had what three years experience? Yeah, three years experience. I remember mm. it was myself and Bore Jose uh, mm. uh, that generation that started law firms very yes. early. Yes. Yeah. So it was. Uh, it was quite a challenge, doomed to fail, but um, destined to succeed. So it's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that, I did quite a lot of litigation then mm. because I was just thinking about just about anything that was law, anything law that was coming my way. So, what was the what was the trick? How did you survive those tough early days? I, I think uh, I've always been saying that. Law practice is more a business of referrals. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you know we, we don't market, so it's more a business of Especially referrals. Especially those days when yes. it was illegal. Exactly. Now it is it's now, lawful. Uh, yeah, now it's lawful. So you help you will help one client, mm. help them very well, and you will get another one. Uh, three three others will come. You will help those three very well. Three from each one of those will come. So. By the end of the year, you have so many people coming your way. That's you exponential know, of, growth, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's what it used to be. Mm. And I think that's some of the culture which I carried uh, from the Rumobo uh, practitioners, legal practitioners, and I established it at Tebo uh, Hosebo Tennis. Mm. So when we were running with it, the firm really grew. And there was a point where I was actually feeling a bit more ashamed about myself because I'm in love with cars. I love cars. <laughs> so I was buying cars left, right and center. I had the money <laughs> yeah, when yeah. I was young. Yeah. So, um, but uh, soon, soon, sooner than later. Not just any car. Yeah. I remember a big American one. What is it called? The, the one? H2. The Hummer. Yeah. yeah, yeah I remember yeah. you asking me, how much did you buy this car? Uh, hey. Then I couldn't tell you because yeah. you're going to be very angry with me. <laughs> yeah. So that was the, the story. Um, yeah, the, the firm grew exponentially, uh, mm. with the result that in 2004, I think I, I had had just too much in terms of my my body was taking too much. I, I, I had bent out. Mm. So I invited uh, uh, Mr. Piyush Sharma mm -hmm. to, into partnership. So we ran with the partnership for 10 years. Wow. Uh, 10 years, four months. Mm. Uh, and, and in 2014, um, we, 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 we amicably part ways and mm. I continued as several years. Yes, um, in this market, is a, it's a huge success yeah, no, it, for it partnership was, yeah. to last that long. No, absolutely. So mm. at some point, you find that you, you have different interests. Mm. You are more focused on this and the other guy is focused on the other, the other thing. And maybe your, your approach towards 
running of the practice is, is a bit more different. Yeah. So yeah, we amicably broke apart, uh, you know. Uh, Can you share a little yeah. bit on that? Because a lot of people, when they part, it's not amicable. What, what, how did you go about ensuring that the split is an amicable one? I, I think we, we, we had always maintained dif different clientele within the same umbrella. So it was always easy for us to identify which kind of work I, I enjoy doing and which kind of work he, he enjoyed doing. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was more of that. Mm -hmm. And also the engagement mm -hmm. leading towards us parting, we had to agree on a lot of things because we, you know, our firm had, the, the name and the goodwill was, was quite humongous. Mm -hmm. And having to split it, we needed to also cushion the effect that it will have on the clients. Yes. And also to ensure that we don't lose out on the goodwill that we've built. Mm -hmm. So we had to work together in order to ensure that, that 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 doesn't happen. Even after the split, you could, yeah. you could do yeah, referrals? We, we to continue, each. yeah, I still do referrals. He still, still does referrals to me mm. for matters that he knows I'm very good with. Okay. So, yeah, uh, it was not a very nice thing to do, obviously, mm. uh, because the brand itself was, was quite huge and it, it, it was very established. Mm. But for me, it was always easier to re-establish Sibiru Atenis because it, it had been there before. Yes. So yes, I, and, you know, so when I got into the new path now, I had to now start saying, coming up with new um, innovations as to how to better uh, run the firm and, you know, just do a few administrative changes mm -hmm. and, and structure of the firm itself. So, yeah. what, what did you say are the major innovations that you adopted? Look, I, I still feel that um, when I started doing this um, ISO certification, mm -hmm. the BOPS yes. certification, you know, BOPS is, uh, they, they give you international standards. You know, when you are doing uh, quality management, uh, it means that your quality standards are acceptable all over the world. So mm -hmm. if somebody is coming from wherever mm -hmm. around the world and they're looking for a firm that can give him the standard or give her the standard that they are receiving mm -hmm. elsewhere, you know, the, the firm will be certified for that purpose. Yeah, what, what, what does it take to achieve the certification? Well, you need to have systems, documented systems. You need to go for training or your staff need to go for training in order to attain that, uh, that standard. Mm -hmm. And you know, you are audited every six months. It's a very costly thing, and a whole lot of things need to change in your office, like the access code, security, uh, the forms that you use. They are always subjected to review from time to time. Uh, you know, we used to have lawyers having files all over their table. Uh, when you go to your lawyer's yeah. office, you'll see all sorts of files. Mm. You know, yes. but ISO doesn't promote that. Mm. You need to only have the files that you are working on the table. Mm. The ones that are not being worked, out, worked have on to be filed. have to be filed away and have to be diarized mm. appropriately. So uh, every single day when, we, when the day comes to closure, mm -hmm. we, we need to have all the files uh, out so of the So the ISO desk. certification yeah. in encourages a lot of uh, mechanization and, and, and computerization. Absolutely. Mm. It, it encourages... Uh, you know, your systems, your filing has to be top-notch. Mm -hmm. you, you, there, there shouldn't be any um, opportunities for leaks, you know, and, and you know, files that are, go unattended because maybe you are too busy or they just fell between the cracks. Mm. So the system will pick those mm -hmm. easily. So, and another thing also is to ensure that even if I'm not there, the kind of service that uh, a client will receive mm -hmm. is pretty much the same mm -hmm. uh, in terms of standard. Whenever I do uh, safe quality ex assurance. Yeah. So, for example, if I do a divorce case, I'm just giving you an example. Mm. Um, there's information that I elicit from a client. Um, I've standardized the information that we should elicit from a client, which mm -hmm. the client has to complete. Yes. And that information, uh, whenever somebody comes with a, a marital issue, we uh, ask the client to complete that, uh, mm -hmm. that form. And quite often, it gives us the entire spectrum of the client's problem. Mm -hmm. And we are able to then apply ourselves without, without uh, having to ask for additional information. So without so, wasting yeah, the client's yeah, time. Exactly. Same goes with conveyancing mm -hmm. and land law. Whenever you come, you want to do a transfer, you want to do a mortgage, there are certain 
a form that you have to complete mm. and certain documentation that we require from you on the spot. Mm -hmm. And that quite often are the only documents you are going to be required to finish. Yes. So you, we don't have this back and forth mm -hmm. because we have standardized. We keep, and we keep improving those forms as and when uh, you know, new laws emerge. Like okay. right now we've got the tribal Tribal, new Tribal Land Act. It just you came know, into force this year, Exactly, right? on the 20th of April. Yeah. So you, you have all these things coming up and we, we change our forms to, to, mm -hmm. to keep in touch with, with the new laws, yeah. Am I right in thinking you're the only firm that is ISO certified? Yes, we, we are. You know, it, it was quite an exciting uh, challenge for, for uh, Bureau of Standards when they were doing our, our certification because it was a very difficult process. We went through it for, for two mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. in order to get ourselves ready to be, to be examined and, and, and approved. And, and why do you think your colleagues, uh, the firms, have not followed suit? I've had a number of inquiries, uh, but I also uh, certification requires uh, an investment. You have to capitalize it. Mm -hmm. Fortunately for me, and thanks to Lea, Lea uh, you know, were quite interested back then. They put up about 85% of, of the cost. So mm. we had to get a consultant mm. close to half a million, mm. uh, you know, if you look at the entire process. Mm -hmm. And then also the other thing is there are many changes that you have to establish within the firm. Mm -hmm. um, having to dedicate a server room, uh, having to, to, to have a dedicated um, store room that, that is properly... Um, mm. Uh, you, with proper security, yeah. you know, those are things that you have to in start investing on in order to meet the standard mm. which they require. Yes. One thing I've noticed when I get to your firm is that it looks so corporate. Is it part of the ISO certification that you have to look a certain way? Uh, well, not necessarily. I think part of it is also, you know, you, you always have to take care of your image. Mm. It's something that you've always been, yeah. you know. If you remember, <laughs> one of the things when I joined was for them to set up a, a an office of their own. Mm. So when you have a, your own office, yeah. you can pretty much... Yeah, that's anything. when we moved to, to yeah, the main that's mall. When we moved yeah, from, from the main mall, mall to... to, to uh, next near to the UBS. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I did pretty much the same, mm. uh, you know, pretty much the template. Mm. So I I developed my own office. Mm. And it looks very nice. Yeah, yeah, so I'm able to just do about just about anything, knowing You've that it's replicated a whole a whole lot. You have an in-house deputy sheriff as well. You have an in-house collection system. You you, you replicated. <laughs> I'm yes, very proud yeah. of the fact that you you took everything. No, copy absolutely. And, I mean, I, you you always have to learn from from from, from others. You don't mm. reinvent the wheel. Yes. Uh, you you can only improve it. Mm. Uh, so that's what I I've done. I've, I've always looked around internationally. When I go to Namibia, like when I decided to set up my my law office. Mm. I had been inspired by a law firm in Namibia. Mm -hmm. I was buying a property in Namibia, so I went into some office. I was blown away. Mm -hmm. So when I came back, I knew how I wanted my office to look like. Yes, yes. yes. Um, well, you've also been part of the law society. Tell us how you ended up being the chairman of the Botswana Law Society. Um, around 2004, I, I think that that about I. The law society was was not such a. Um, it wasn't such the it wasn't the pressure group it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. It's a civil society, um, you know, organization that it was meant to be in my view. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it was always more about lawyers this, lawyers that, lawyers this, lawyers that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, as opposed to just promoting the world welfare and well-being of lawyers. It's more about taking yeah, other it, lawyers. Yeah, that exactly. was the impression. Yeah, yeah that's the, yeah, when you, whenever you get a call from the law society, you get scared mm. and you think, ah, what do they want this time? Yeah. What have I done wrong? Yeah. So that's the time when I decided to, to take up the challenge. I started off as uh, the vice chairperson uh, to, to Duma Boko, mm -hmm. who, who was the chairperson for two years. Mm -hmm. Then thereafter, I became chairman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think during the time when I was uh, running the Law Society, a whole lot of interesting things uh, happening. We started becoming vocal. Uh, when, when, what was that time when you were there? Yeah, it was the time 
around judicial, extrajudicial killings, mm -hmm. when we wanted to even take uh, uh, the former president uh, Hama to to task, to, yeah, to oh. yeah, to the International Criminal Court mm. for for not taking action on on uh, you know. On well, the I abuse that was very, yeah. very blatant. Mm. So we, we, we're taking issues, even other issues like the media law. Uh, we, we had a retreat in Francistown where we discussed the media law and we decided this is a draconian law. It is not promoting human rights. Mm. It is anti-freedom of speech. And we decided to not to participate. Mm -hmm. And according to that act, we as the law society were supposed to appoint the chairperson of the the appeal tribunal mm -hmm. and i remember in the absence of the chairperson uh, you know the the whole thing the whole structure collapsed so you, yeah. if i recall correctly you deliberately withheld your consent to appoint that person yes we 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 we, we i mean i called lawyers to we had a, a small group to, a small group to look into the law a pressure group so, yeah a small, a small select group, select group yeah, yes. to, to look into to review that law yes and advise the council mm -hmm. and they came up with a, a very clear view that this this law was 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 really anti anti-media and we we had a, a retreat in francis town to discuss it and to formalize a position so that is not my position mm. it is the position of the law society so we took that position as a collective, as a uh, as the legal profession, mm -hmm. so that was a very important intervention in my view. Even extrajudicial killings, we pressurized until uh, the, the the perpetrators were brought to book. If you recall, also we, we there was the issue of appointment of judges that we have always viewed not to be transparent. We said no, there's need for pe to, to be open up. We need to open it up, have adverts, invite people to to show interest if they, 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 they want to. So those are some of the changes that mm. took place. I'm going to talk to you later about the, the state of the judiciary. For now, can you tell me um, how you went about lobbying, whether it's difficult to lobby to get into the law society for some young aspiring lawyer watching you now, if they want to be part of the, the law society council, what does it take? Um, well, you, 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 you need to be driven um, because you can't just go to the law society for, for the sake of just going there. It's not about being seen or having some kind of power. Actually, there's no power there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's about making contribution, mm -hmm. knowing that you don't get paid for it, but you are helping to shape the, the, the judiciary or the, the legal profession rather. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was it's a the form drive. of public service. It's a form of public service. So for, for me at the time, one of the things that I, I wanted, I wanted a, a lawyer-friendly law society, for example. Mm -hmm. I wanted the law society to be housed in its own, in its own building. It's some of the things that I achieved during my time. Yes. Um, but importantly, um, I also wanted to ensure that we contribute towards things like um, a free legal service week and just bringing Pro bono lawyers, work, yeah, lawyers closer to the people. Mm -hmm. uh, you, if you recall, there was a stage where lawyers were considered to be aliens or from mm. another planet and, yeah. and I think they also looked at themselves like they are slightly above other people <laughs> in society. Leonard friends, yeah, so, pompers yeah, yeah, and what not. Exactly. Yeah, the way they... So it's one of the things that I really wanted to tear apart mm. so that lawyers can start regarding themselves as normal citizens, mm. professionals, accessible, friendly, you know, those kind of things. And I, I, I lived mm. that and uh, ensure that the law, the mm. law profession also mm. is reflected in that manner. So I think one of the things that I would encourage a, a young lawyer uh, who wish to make a contribution towards the profession mm. is to first of all define what they want to achieve, what how the outlook which they want the the law fraternity to be viewed from. Mm. You know, once we have that in place, then you can. Um, sell a message to other people, to your colleagues, that look, guys, I want to come in, I want to help uh, achieve the following ideals, mm -hmm. and and yeah, and the, the, you don't just idea. go there for the position, you Not go there for, for the, the contribution. Yeah, that's yeah. great advice. Yeah. Um, so, apart from uh, those two successes, I mean, I think this one is a big one of establishing your uh, the law society's own, uh, you know, headquarters. Yeah. And also um, being really a pressure group 
in terms of uh, being involved in, in the selection of judges and so on. Yeah. Apart from those, what, what are the other achievements that you, you, you managed to come up with? Yeah, I, I, one of the things that I recall very well, and uh, okay, two important ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know whether one, the other I should say, but I will say it anyway. Mm. The first one was, was us ensuring that uh, the body that was responsible for appointing uh, board members of um, parastatals, um, which is the name PEPA, is it PEPA? Yes, I yeah, think that's yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah, yes. we, we, we had an engagement with them and we agreed that in every board there should be a lawyer. Mm. You know, so we were always consulted to give a name, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to recommend somebody, to, recommend somebody to, to, to sit in BPC board or whatever board it was. Mm -hmm. So for that was, it, it worked very well for us because the law profession now started um, entrenching itself into various, um, you know, organizations within the, the government. Yes, mm -hmm. especially, yeah, especially parastatals. Mm -hmm. So that was one. That's a big one, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we were so important in that regard because every time when the, the board had to be appointed, um, we always get in a letter asking us to recommend somebody mm. from the legal fraternity yes, to sit yes. in the board. Mm. And then the other one, uh, you know, uh, it's what got me um, my fingers bent with, with other lawyers yeah. where we were saying we can't be talking about localization of the bench, which is something that we achieved during, during my time pressurizing for localization of the bench. Mm. We can't talk about localization of the bench, benches and mm. the judges yeah. and stuff. Yes, yes. Uh, we also should talk about localization of the bar, mm -hmm. as in us as private Citizen. practitioners. Mm. How many citizens do we have? Mm. How many, uh, why can't we have a lot of our people being absorbed into, into private practice? Mm -hmm. I think that was something that, um, unfortunately, the message was mis misinterpreted, misinterpreted to say that uh, you're anti-foreigners, anti but that was not the point. Mm. Exactly what I said uh, back then is what is now happening. We are producing over 8,200 graduate, law graduate a year. And a big where number. do they go? I mm. mean, they can't be absorbed by government. Mm. They have to be absorbed by the private, by, 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 by the legal profession, the mm. private, private sector. Mm. So that's something that we are talking about back then to try and pave way for, for mm. such. So yeah, it, it unfortunately got me bent, feel my fingers bent, <laughs> uh, because then uh, lawyers, some lawyers really took it um, yeah. the wrong way. I know that yeah. there was a lot of noise about yeah. it. You mentioned that we're producing between 80 and 100 lawyers a year. Is that number desirable? Um, are we not saturating the profession? Well, unfortunately, the this thing of lawyers, the number growing, and the economy growing, they, they have to go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. We can't have a, a, a stagnant economy and many lawyers. Mm -hmm. We have to really have our economy moving up and up. I think um, that's now for government mm -hmm. to ensure that our economy is robust, mm. our economy grows. Well, the government yeah. and us, the yes, business yes, sector. As, yes. Yeah, as the business sector, mm. we obviously need a, a conducive environment to operate yes. uh, and grow our businesses. Mm. So. Uh, for me, it's really, um, I, I don't necessarily see anything wrong with us having uh, more lawyers because the more the merrier. Mm. Um, I would say, competition. especially uh, for competition, especially for people that, are, that could not afford, otherwise not afford mm. uh, those kind of lawyers. Yeah. So they will have other uh, up and coming lawyers who are willing to take up their cases. So mm -hmm. I, I don't really see anything wrong with it. The only thing is we need to tighten up the screws to ensure that the profession remains a, a clean profession. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we keep to our ethics, ethical standards are observed. That, that is for me is the mm -hmm. only challenge because quite often when there is uh, more, you start getting some characters that are really not um, mm -hmm. desirable. What I noticed, I don't know whether there's an indication of success or it's something we should be concerned about is every January or February, there's a long list of lawyers who are being taken off the, the list. Yeah. I don't know whether this is something we should celebrate or lament. In other words, is it an indication that there are more 
good lawyers remaining or is an indication that there are a lot of bad apples out there? Well, I think for me it's an indication of the law society doing its job well. Um, obviously, the ideal situation is to have a zero disbarment or a zero, um, you know, delisting of a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for me, uh, it's a call for us as lawyers to also introspect and, and see whether we are observing to the ethical standards that we, we were taught at school mm -hmm. or that we have sus subscribed to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's, um, you can't blame the law society for calling out a lawyer who is a, del a delinquent. Mm -hmm. But similarly, as the law society, we always have to ask ourselves, have we done enough to try and ensure that uh, people know what they are supposed to do mm. and they operate within certain yeah. parameters. Because in yeah. some cases, people are simply not complying with uh, you know, the requirement to audit their accounts, the yes. trust account. Yes. Mm. Yeah, quite, quite often um, it's because we'll have some laws that are not implemented. Uh, because maybe the law society also is, is overstretched. You know, as you know, over... 60% of our members are not even paying for, for you know, the, for the sustenance yeah, the, of the law society. Yeah, if into the fidelity yeah, fund. Yeah, if government was to help uh, with those 60% mm. to pay to the law society, the law society will be better able to roll out mm. a, a program. You're talking about the fidelity fund? Yes. Mm. You remember the, the, the every lawyer pays for pay, yeah, this certificate. Yes, it's quite a hefty yeah, amount. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, the government and parastatals are not paying. Mm. So that means that we've lost a huge um, uh, you know, section of our members who are not contributing towards the, mm. the running of the law society. You know, we, you, you realize that in the law, uh, in the Legal Practitioners Act, there's a provision for um, quarterly submission of uh, bank statements of trust accounts. Mm. But you, you need to have resources to ensure that that, that, that is, is complied done. with. Yes. So we always wait for the end of the year, and that's why mm. um, things always go this way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Now, I want to talk about business, your business endeavors. Beyond the law, what business activities are you involved in? Um, I once tried a business venture when I was a, a young man, mm. um, which I... Abandoned after two years. <laughs> Why? Um, I was running a cash loan, yeah. uh, but in a more formal setup. Mm. The the amount of money I was making was scary. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was before regulation came into place. Yeah, and we were charging more than twenty percent interest per month. Per month. Yeah. I, I, I still remember. I mean, I put a small investment of probably 200k mm. back then mm. uh, because that was maybe around 2001 2000-2001 then mm. about mm. so I put a small investment of about 200k mm. and then by the end of two years my book had grown to boom 1.7 million yeah and I was like what's going on here mm. I mean I for the first time and I'm, I'm not saying That's this. micro lending, right? Yeah, it was micro lending, but it was unregulated. Mm -hmm. Back then, uh, it was a loan shark business. Yeah. So right now, uh, it's regulated, and now it's 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 it's, it's micro lending, which is which is okay. Mm. But back in the day, it was you uh, literally a loan shark. You take somebody's ID, uh, their banking card, mm. you know, their ATM, mm. and then at the end of the month. You'll be queuing all over. Your boys will be all over <laughs> yeah. town, cashing money mm. at twelve o'clock midnight mm. when the, when people's accounts are credited. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that, that's the first business that I really got involved. Yeah, yeah. But it scared me two years later when it was making a lot of money, and I felt really too clean. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I decided to close it out of the blue and said, "No, I'm, mm. I've had it." It's, yeah, yeah. I was always having money on my pocket because <laughs> uh, you know it was a. It was a purely cash business. Mm. Uh, so somebody will get, maybe they will have a, a situation at home, they borrow 2,000 pula from you, you give them at interest of 20,000 pula. 20%? Like, yeah, 20% rather. Mm. Yeah, and they will be, at the end of the month, they can't raise the two 2,400. So they, they will pay you 400 pula. Mm. Uh, and then they are back at 2,000 again. Mm. So by the end of, 
10 months, mm. they have literally paid you 4,000, mm. but they still owe you 2,000 mm. and the interest for the following month. And mm. that was how it was. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, I had to shut it down because it didn't sound like clean money to yeah. me. So uh, morally you were, you were troubled by this. Yeah, it was troubling. Mm. So that's when I, I started focusing more on the property investment mm -hmm. um, business. So you just closed yeah. it down? No, I did. I just closed it down. One mm. morning I woke up mm. and I said to the guys, I'm paying you three months salaries mm. and I'm shutting this business. They were asking why. You just make, just, this is your yeah. money spinner. Mm. But I said, no, guys. Because each time I meet these people that are, that are getting money from me, mm. I really felt bad. Mm. Uh, you know, they could not get themselves out of the debt, mm -hmm. so to speak. So it, I decided to close it. Yeah, yeah. So that's when I now moved my interest towards a, a property, property investment. Remember, I, in the early 2000s, mm. things were so easy. Compared I mean, to now? Yeah, compared to now. Plots at Brocade were... Going Brocade, for 40,000. No, yeah. it 20, was 18. 18, 18, 18, 1, 8, 1, 8. But I remember then we were thinking it's expensive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some people were thinking it's expensive. Yes, yes, yes. Some people thought so. I think it was short-sighted. Yeah, uh, you know, short-sightedness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, a lot of things started happening during that era. Mm. Whenever you had money, put it into property. Mm. And also I was okay. inspired by people like... Um, yourselves and mm. uh, uh, we had a client mm. uh, I shouldn't name the client mm. who was who is a property mogul mm -hmm. uh, remember yes, uh, yes when you yeah. started Box 6 yeah he's one of my mentors yes 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 yes, 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 I, yes, yes. we did we did all that for him yeah, yeah. we did that, uh, that for him that mm. entire mm. Block 6 estate for him so mm. I learned quite a lot mm. from my dealings then yes so um, and obviously the dealings with you so I started picking mm. all these lessons and, and, and applying them mm. uh, I, I really felt that um, property investment Although I still do invest in shares and companies and so on, mm. and maybe other small businesses on the side, but mm. that's my main business. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I do property investment, uh, whether by way of building and selling. Mm. Um, but flipping. Yeah, flipping. Mm. But I've stopped flipping now. Mm. Uh, I'm now planning towards my to retirement. To buy and hold. Yeah, I'll buy and hold and, and mm. sustain myself. After With which area is it? I mean, we have categories like residential, multi-residential, industrial, and commercial. I, I have been focusing, small portion of it has been commercial, mm -hmm. uh, but the large portion of it has been um, residential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found residential, especially at a lower scale, uh, that is from... 2000 to four grand mm -hmm. rent house per unit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those are, they are high spinners. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I the one said a house in Pakalani mm -hmm. that I tried to rent out, mm -hmm. it was there for nine months. Mm. I was taking care of it for nine months. Without and, getting any yeah, income? Yeah, and to, without getting any income. I couldn't get a tenant. Mm. And when I got a tenant, they were negotiating like very, negoti negotiating very hard. Mm. And then I felt, ah, this is not making commercial sense for me. Mm. I then sold it and then built with the money. Mount I was rest. able to build, I think, two or three projects mm. out of that. So for me, that, that's like the kind of, mm. yeah, it's, it's a bit more... The income is a bit more passive. Yeah, than yeah. Active. So, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. you still get those calls to fix toilets and doors and lights and things like that. Of course, that's mm. that. That's where now you need to have a team mm -hmm. that is a maintenance team that unfortunately we have to pay for. Or fortunately mm. for them, yeah. you have to pay them every month in order to ensure that they. Mm -hmm. So you've yeah. established like a, a Sebero property somewhere. Yeah. Well, um. I have that arrangement with a different mm -hmm. um, individual that I've been working with for a long so time. So then you have somebody doing uh, management for you? Yes. If, if, uh, you, you've seconded management to somebody? No. Unlike us who uh, yes. are now actually have people on the payroll yes. are managing. Is that, yeah, is that I right? haven't reached the level uh, where I have a management team, but I, yes, but my my wife is the one who does, mm -hmm. who does those. Uh, mm -hmm. I, my purpose is to, to just build mm. and hand over, mm. build and hand over. Yeah. I think she does have uh, one or two people that assist her to, to, manage. to, to manage the properties. Okay, yes. all right. Yeah. Another area of interest for me is um, football. 
Yes. Where you have been president of Botswana Football Association at some point. I think two terms, eh? No, three? one. One term. Yeah, one term. And um, you even met Sub Plata. I remember seeing you on the papers with him. Yes. Uh, tell us about the, your football interests and then and why football? Well, first of all, I think football is the one that took me out of the streets when I was growing up in Old Naledi. I was playing football, Khabarun United, um, all that development teams I played there. Mm -hmm. um, although I was an Otwani supporter, but they were closer to home. Mm -hmm. So they, they were my natural home. Mm -hmm. um, and even when I was at school, football, I still continue to play football. Mm -hmm. So I, I've always been playing football. So when I was at university, I played um, first division, Khabaroni Kicks, and uh, Premiership Mukosi Young Fighters. Oh. Yes, uh, we actually were the finalists, first, first team from first division to be finalist of the the then Coca-Cola Cup, which mm -hmm. was like the FA Cup yes. back in the day. What so position were you playing? I was a striker, number 10. Okay. That's where my mother name comes from. Oh, okay. Yeah, from the time I was in okay. uh, primary school, yes. Okay. So, yeah. Um, you are the goal scorer. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, creating goals and scoring goals. Yes, yes. yes. Um, so, I then, when I became busy with law, Mm. I, I couldn't really make time to go to training, mm. so I was absorbed into uh, management. Uh, but back then there was a, an issue that was going on, a hot issue, um, about the state of football in, in Botswana. Mm. Uh, we formed a, a rival association called BOSA, BOSA mm -hmm. Botswana Soccer Association. Uh, that was now community teams feeling that uh, the ground playing Levels was not even, and we mm. formed that. So it's a second division team. No, it was Rollers, all of them. Not only, all these teams, Ghana's, mm. all these teams, the people's team, so mm. to speak. Mm. So we, they used to have players, and those players will go to, to to um, discipline forces team, mm -hmm. either taken by police or or BDF or. Uh, one of those teams to because they get paid, jobs. Eh? no, because yeah, they will get them jobs, mm. and then they will be able to to then move to those teams. Mm. And our teams were always struggling with transportation, sponsorships, and so on. Mm. So we then formed a, a group called um, formed a, an association called Botswana Soccer Association. Mm -hmm. And after, yeah, so I was a, a baby lawyer then, and, but I was charged. <laughs> you're with using the you're using the wording of Richard Lyons, yes, baby lawyer. Baby lawyer. <laughs> you called yes. everybody a baby lawyer. Yeah. So I I was charged with the responsibility of just ensuring that all the legal issues are in place. So thereafter, of course, that um, that did, did not carry on because we there was a, a meeting that fused the two. Um, the, the the dispute was resolved, hmm. and then we went back to Botswana Football Association, and then I carried so on. So the the issues that caused you to create a rival organization were resolved. Yes, and then you went back to the yes. FA. Yes, yeah, we even agreed that at the time that uh, every uh, discipline forces team or institutional team, so to speak, would have one team only. Uh, you know, not one in Francis Town, not another in Havron, the other one in Pique, mm. you know, so they will have only one team. Uh, you know, we agreed on issues of gay takings, how they are going to be shared, looking at the, the, the challenges we had. So I then became the chairperson of the disciplinary committee and um, of the BFA. Of the BFA. Mm. I was still um, probably 28, mm. and then I became the legal advisor um, for uh, under uh, under Philip Mere, who was the president, and mm. also under David Fanny. Mm. And then that's when I challenged David Fanny to, for presidency, and mm. I became the president of the mm -hmm. association. Yes. Okay. All right. Any memorable, uh, memorable things that you did during your tenure? Well, um, during... Um, when I was still part of the NEC, we, we qualified for the AFCON 2012. First but, time ever. Yeah. But credit must be given, obviously, to the previous presidents mm. who had literally worked to ensure that it happens. Mm. And obviously, the, the, the technical team and the, 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 the players. But that was uh, when we started having uh, frequent qualifications because we then had the under 17 
qualifying also for their under 17 AFCON, so to speak. Mm. Yeah, so uh, administratively, the, the game grew in terms of sponsorship value. Mm -hmm. We had sponsors, sponsorship for national teams, even under 23s. Because um, of your efforts? Yeah, because, uh, yeah, because of our, my efforts. And, mm -hmm. and also because the previous, I literally continued the good work that the other guys had done. But mm -hmm. obviously I took a different turn mm -hmm. in terms of how to approach things. Mm -hmm. So even our Premier League, at some point it was amongst the top 10 in Africa in wow. terms of sponsorship value. Mm -hmm. So when I left, that's where it was. And when I left the association as president, we are number 86. In the world? In the world, in the world yes. Mm. And I think there's number 23 in Africa. Wow. Yeah, we are now number 148, I think. Mm. Um, yeah, that's where we yeah. are sitting. I hope that doesn't reflect badly on the, on the leadership. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think uh, we, we all have our approach mm. towards uh, development. Sometimes some would sacrifice the national team and focus elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I hope that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, but that's, that's a different issue yeah. for another day. How did you get an opportunity to meet Sub Platter? I I was very fortunate to be appreciated by by a lot of leaders in Africa because I in the meetings I used to speak mm. whether in CAF or in FIFA I would raise my hand and speak to some issues mm. you know so I was first noticed by CAF and they appointed me into a committee called like the top committee it, 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 it's called the Afcon Organizing Committee the one that organizes Africa Cup of Nations. Mm -hmm. So the executive committee sits in that committee as well. Mm -hmm. So I was also, I took over a position in FIFA uh, for marketing and television uh, committee. That, that was like a committee that was responsible for making money for, 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 for FIFA at the time. Mm -hmm. So I had interactions with Sir Blatter after one of my comments at the, at, uh, the FIFA meetings. And then, yeah, that's how I, I mm -hmm. invited him over. I was, at the time, the youngest president in, in, in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the youngest FA president in the world. You, you just sent him a letter, come over, and he came? No, we spoke about it. Mm -hmm. And then he said, yeah, no, that, that's fine, I will pay you a visit. It was his second visit to Botswana, by the way. Mm -hmm. Fanny had done it before, okay. and then I invited him also. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, he got embroiled in all kinds of issues. I was led to read recently that he's been exonerated. Yeah, football is very political. Um, it's unfortunately uh, there's a whole lot of different um, interests pulling everywhere. Mm. Uh, but Sir Blatter was was a good president mm. uh, by and large for Africa, especially or for developing footballing nations. He was a very very good um, president. I, 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 he's the one who pushed for. Uh, the World Cup to come to South Africa. Yes, yes, and also he ensured that there are grants. Mm. Um, all these countries are getting grants, uh, you know, all over the world. He ensured that all the federations are getting grants. Something mm. that I keep saying to, to all the FAs that if you are getting grants from your mother body, mm. it means that you also have to get, give grants mm. to your substructures. Then the substructures must also give grants to the clubs. Mm. I think this is something that it's a philosophy that I derive from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So what is your current involvement now with football? I am sitting at in the board of directors for Botswana Football League, mm -hmm. uh, which is like the, the highest league, mm -hmm. first division and premier league. It's got a board okay. of directors. So I'm sitting there. What's yeah. the role of the board mainly? Um, the role of the board is to give strategic guidance to to football at that level, professional football. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what we, we do. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, do you believe there are things uh, that need to be done if, if uh, there was a wish list of changes that you'd like to see? What would it be? Um, first of all, I think we just need to change our mindset as leadership mm -hmm. in football. We need to think uh, about clubs as our main building blocks. And we need to always ask ourselves, what is it that we are doing that is benefiting clubs? Instead of saying, what are clubs doing that is benefiting us? Mm. We have to always think, what is it that we are giving to clubs to ensure that they participate almost, in our league? It almost sounds like a JFK 
uh, yes. question. What are you doing for your country instead of what the country exactly, does for you? Yeah. Exactly. That's the, that, for me, that's the thinking. Because, mm. you know, um, for Afrin, a club called Notwani Football Club as a president, mm. the amount of money that I was putting every single day. From your own pocket. From my own pocket. And it's money that's not coming back. Mm. It's money going into the game and not coming back to me. Mm. So you, you, if you are now at, at sitting where I am as a board member, the question that you always have to ask yourself or mm -hmm. in leadership of football is what is it that you are doing mm. to ensure that people don't put out their money? They, in fact, we give, we give them subsidies mm -hmm. in order to participate in the league and pay their players. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see us uh, coming back to uh, AFCON or even going to the World Cup no, we, anytime in the future? Uh, we shall. Uh, it will take a bit of planning. Mm. Um, but probably if we have a 10, 12 year program, mm -hmm. we'll get back, we'll get to the World Cup. Is, is our population size working against us? No, no, absolutely not. Uh, a lot of countries that are playing regularly in the World Cup have lesser population than ourselves. Like which one? Yeah, like Uruguay. Um, Uruguay, yeah. Uruguay, sorry. Uruguay, mm. yeah. Mm. It's a small, these mm. are very big footballing nations, but mm. they're very small in terms of numbers. Even the, the, these islands in Africa mm. uh, that are now qualifying for AFCON every, every, every other edition. Which one? Comoros? Uh, Comor the other yeah, one. I can't uh, forget the, the other one. Yeah, yeah, there was the other, other one that played with South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, where people thought it was going to be beaten by South Africa 10-0, yeah. yeah. but it pulled a surprise. So that's the kind of nations that are coming up in football. Mm. But their population is, is not necessarily mm. um, bigger than ours. Yeah. So is it just a simple case of putting more money in football? Yes, and be, being organized, mm. ensuring that football money goes to football. And, and not it, to administrators. Yeah, not, not to, yeah if, you know, the, 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 the Russian how we divide the cake. Mm. Administration should take a small part mm. and the large part should go to the technical, to the actual game itself. Yeah, to yeah. the development yeah. of talent. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. All right. Um, I want you to talk about uh, ingredients for your success in terms of what you think are the essential components um, running a successful law firm, being in the property business, being successful in football. What would you say, looking at all these areas, are the key components or ingredients for success? Um, for me, what, what, what matters most, the two most critical ones, are hard work and humility. Mm -hmm. For me, those are like the key pillars of my success. Mm. Obviously, it has to be coupled with others like you need to know your if you are a lawyer you need to know your law mm. you know you need to be passionate about your law mm. uh, you need to have interest in what you're doing you know you you don't just go in and think that things are just going to be ha happening you, you you need to know your stuff mm. and i always say to people that when you choose a career make sure you choose something that you you will like Mm. something that you enjoy, something that you could even take up if you, are, if you are not getting paid. Yes. You know, if the moment you have that, then you are in the right place and you can start making your money, mm. you know. Uh, so one thing also is also to, to, to be innovative. You need to always be thinking about new ideas. How do you, how do you ensure that you stay relevant? You know, right now our law firms are over 20 years. Uh, mine is what, 22 years? Mm. Um, mine is 30, uh, yeah. 30, 30 plus. Ex exactly. So mm. we have to keep being relevant. You, mm. you can't just remain the law firm you were in 2000. You have to, to change a lot of things as you go mm. because everything keeps changing. Mm -hmm. Introduce uh, you know, uh, new innovations. Look for other opportunities, new opportunities. There are now international opportunities out there. Like right now, um, I have a, a, a partnership um, a working partnership, so to speak, an association rather, mm. with a law firm in Kigali. Mm -hmm. It's called, it's called Abayo, yes, mm. Abayo Law Firm. So it, it, these are opportunities. Once in a while, I do get clients from... Referred by them. Yeah, referred by them to, to me here. Mm. And when I... Because now our governments are beginning to, to do business with each other quite often. Mm. So it means that there are opportunities that exist there. So other things also include like things like legal training, 
uh, there are bodies that people can um, you know register with mm. to ensure that uh, BQA to ensure yeah. that whenever there's a training for a legal training mm. uh, for an organization they can bid to to do training for for those uh, for those organizations if for example the land boards need to be taught about the new law the new tribal land uh, act, uh, act. Mm. Uh, you know you could put a proposal because you are BQA accredited to, to ensure that you, 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 know, you, you teach those people and you make your money in the process. Yeah. You, know, th that's how, that's, you have to keep being innovative and thinking about new things mm -hmm. that could um, keep you in touch with the times. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And would you still uh, encourage people, uh, youngsters, somebody just finishing that from five who's done well at school, would you still encourage them to go into the legal profession or would you suggest that they go straight into business? Um, you know, frankly speaking, education is important, very, very important. And the law profession is exciting. Um, you know, it's not boring. Are, the profession that you are in, it's not a boring profession. Whether it makes money or not, it's a You're never bored. <laughs> yeah, you are never bored. There's always something interesting. So, um, but I've also seen situations where um, students who I would say were not as smart as ours mm. um, took a different line and uh, got into business administration or uh, some finance, courses like yeah. this, finance. And then they are CEOs, you know? So I get to ask myself, because law in the past was for A students, mm. like you have to be an A student to 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 to, to read law, yes, um, or to be admitted for law. And um, those who took maybe B student, B second class, mm. would probably go into business and stuff. But then they are mm. the CEOs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you one has to always ask themselves, what mm. do you want mm. out of your life? I mean, sometimes you, you, your focus is money. Uh, other people, the focus is just pursuing an interest. Uh, if you pursue an interest, it's also easy to make money when you are pursuing something that you like because mm. you don't get tired, mm. you, your energies are always high, mm. you are interested in finding out how, the, how other people are doing it mm. in order to beat them mm. and so on. So I always in, encourage people to follow, um, to follow their, their passion. Yeah. Yeah, because I knew I wanted to be a lawyer mm. uh, way back when I was probably doing from one and from two. I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. Mm. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, we live in a political environment currently. There's talk of a reset agenda, which HE actually gave a speech about. I think um, mid last year. Yeah. And um, in the course of that reset agenda, uh, we have the Ministry of Entrepreneurship. Um, what do you think about these developments and has there, are there actually signs that there's a reset? Looking at, um, you know, the ecosystem in general. The, 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 these are very interesting developments and I think um, they are meant to, to ensure that there's a bit more focus on entrepreneurship and its development. It's, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we still have to see what the ministry has that's going to roll out to 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 us as uh, as, as business people mm. but of course for me I, that's a very good initiative mm. but i always say that you can always have these beautiful ideas if you don't have the political will to ensure that they are independent they have the right people to mend them you know forget about political affiliation mm. or whatever prejudices that may exist. You need to have the right people in the right positions. Sometimes we, we have the unfortunate or misfortune of having people that are probably aligned to certain interests mm. that are unfortunately taking um, lead in certain positions and they can't deliver mm. because they are not capable. Mm. So these kind of initiatives the, the institutions need to be as independent as possible mm. and they need to be meant by people that are capable. So I, I think for me this is a, a plus for government. It's an opportunity for government to, to really drive uh, the agenda that was set by, by, by His Excellency. Mm. But it can only happen 
if we put the right people in the right positions. Mm -hmm. You see, whenever an opportunity arises, we should not, if uh, you put Sebeho there because he's aligned to certain interests, mm -hmm. then you are not doing justice to the, to the idea that we have. And the idea is bound to fail. Mm -hmm. But if you put somebody that you know is qualified, he may not be your friend, he may not share the same allegiance that you have, mm -hmm. but you know that yeah. for purposes of what I'm doing, that I'm going to deliver my, mm. my, my, my project. Then that's, that's for me, is, yeah. yeah. And in, importantly also, we really need to start ensuring that our institutions are, are independent. I mm. think this is part of the reset agenda, yes. to ensure that um, whenever there is a board that is responsible for whatever, um, you know, aspect of, of, of our government, mm. we empower it, and we let it fly on its own. Interference uh, in the board operations mm. is what has put us in in in, in, in a bed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a very good answer. Um, yeah. I was going to take it further and, and ask you whether you you because in the speech when the president was announcing this, he was talking about a kind of inferiority complex, a tendency to look down upon ourselves as Botswana. Um, have you seen this to be the case? As I have. And if so, what do you think can be done to lift our mindset, to have a paradigm shift, to see ourselves uh, in a different light? Um, I, I tend to agree with what H. was are saying. There's this complex that we have as Botswana. But, um, but if you look back as to what causes this, um, it's where people get disgruntled because they feel that certain opportunities that they are deserving to undertake do not come their way because of certain reasons. Mm. You see, I, I, I would say, for example, um, in the law profession, whenever there's a young lawyer who is very capable and who's demonstrated capability, when they come along the way, why not, why should we go to to another country to get an advocate when we have somebody who is capable. It used to happen in the criminal cases until people like Bo Dick Bayford, mm. they started showing that they are as capable as... as uh, if not are. even better. Yeah, <laughs> if not better, you mm. see. So I think we need to start believing in ourselves. It, 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 the research the agenda has to be more about uh, people believing in themselves mm. and government believing in their own people, mm. you see, because the, the energy has to also come from the top to, 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 to the bottom Just and from the, down. yeah, it has to be reciprocal. Mm. So when um, we, we undertake big projects, we also need to, to know that uh, we, whatever that we are undertaking mm. has to reflect on our government. If a government invests uh, so much interest and so much money in you to to undertake an operation, and then you fail it. You are failing a whole lot of us. Mm. And then tomorrow, when you start having complex, mm. some of us who never had the opportunity, um, it's because our counterparts have failed us in, before. So yeah. that, for me, it has to be a two-way street. Mm. We, we we need as government, government needs to really trust its own people, mm. and we need to start having this society that doesn't look that is very, very apolitical mm. in our approach to issues. You see, when I go to um, a government um, institution that funds people, um, I should go there proudly with an idea. Mm -hmm. And I know that if my idea is the best, I'll get assistance. But where you feel that, hey, they You're might not be take it because then. I share a different political agenda, mm -hmm. then, then that's the beginning of the problem that mm -hmm. will never be healed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's a very interesting answer, and it leads, some ways to, to, it leads us to the next point about the state of the judiciary. The, the newspapers have been awash with headlines, which are very, very disturbing. You know, talk of uh, political interference, talk of people not being appointed uh, based on merit, and it's been a sad, sad um, state of affairs where either it's perceptions or reality, where we get the impression that the state of the judiciary is very poor, is very bad. What are your comments? What views do you hold? Um, you have to take the glasses off for this uh, one. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, it's a, we're going through a sad chapter. Mm. And I think 
the sooner we accept that things are not going right, the better for us as a mm. country, uh, as a nation. Mm -hmm. um, judiciary is our last line of defense. Mm -hmm. Whenever anything, any of these three institutions or government goes wrong, the, the judiciary, judiciary is the one that actually has to show us the way mm. and show us the light. So for me, there has to be, it, it has to be clean, spotless. It has to be spotless mm. at any given time. When you taint the judiciary, or when the judiciary is tainted with um, some kind of a, an issue that negates its independence, it, it casts doubt into the entire system. So we, we really need to ensure that when something of this that has been happening lately, when a complaint of this nature comes to to us, to us, we deal it deal with it very very decisively. Mm. We need to be very decisive when we deal with such complaints. Ensure that it ex expeditiously and with so much transparency, mm. the issue is dealt with, and the stain is removed from the profession. It's it's a very sad situation. You see, issues of um, judicial appointments. We shouldn't be having people talking in the corridors. Uh, People are talking in the corridors. They say, um, who should be where? And we as lawyers, we know mm. who is more senior, who is more, uh, capable. Who, who more capable. We know these things. Mm. We, we are there. We, we practice law every day. Mm. You know? So all these things, when they start mounting, they, they, they start um, eating away from the status that the judiciary mm. has. So it's a very worrying situation. I, mm. I think it's not late. Mm. It's not too late for it to be corrected. But I how just does one correct it? Does it require a commission of inquiry? Or what does it, what does it of take? Of course, uh, the, the, the remedies are in place. It, we have remedies that we need to just... We just pull the, the legislation and it, all the remedies are there. Mm. Whenever there's such a complaint, there is a, 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 a body that has to be set up to investigate this mm. and make recommendations. It has to be a, a very impartial um, body mm. of people that, mm. that investigate these, these allegations. Men and women of integrity. Men and women of integrity. Mm. And they come up with uh, recommendations. Mm -hmm. Once they do that, uh, if, if they exonerate um, whoever that needs to be exonerated, we would know that no, whatever that was, uh, what, what, what was alleged, was was not was not correct mm. but similarly if we don't do it expeditiously uh, you know and with that kind of status of people mm. we, we we are going to be left with a stain people are always going to be left in doubt mm. and whenever a judgment comes out somebody will ask themselves well, ah, is it because of the pressure mm. that they felt mm. or is it because of um the the pre-plan mm. that was in place. You ask yourself all, all this. And you, you People shouldn't. even ask about brown envelopes. Yeah, for, for the judiciary, you mm. should never, mm. ever ask those questions. Mm. Whenever a judgment is pronounced, you should know in your conscience as a citizen that mm. no. Um, you know, because mm. the voice of the judiciary is the voice of God. Mm. In the absence of God... But, but, but in Botswana, the judiciary used to, be, used to be sacrosanct. When did it suddenly change? At the time when I was practicing... In our courts during the time of Mobo Abuaje, even Bo New Man, Lebo Collins and others, Bo Marumo, there was never any issue. When, when did it suddenly just change so fast? Um, I think we started having, um, you see, when you start having uh, the executive and parliament, these legs of government, mm. arms of government, having a say in this one mm. then we start clouding the separation of powers mm -hmm. because separation of powers is key uh, to a democratic state so when you have a, a, a judiciary that's independent in in the literal sense of it you know when there's little interference as to what it starts administratively because it starts with administratively. Mm -hmm. So when you allow the judiciary from an ad administrative point of view to run independently, to have its own budget, to, to be uh, 
properly resourced mm. and not to go to government to beg. Because the moment they start begging from the executive, then the executive will now start pulling the strings. Mm. And when they start pulling the strings, mm. they, that's where now you start questioning yourself as to um, whether or not the, the, mm. the judiciary is independent. I think mm. it started some couple... Uh, the last five yeah, years or yeah, so. Yeah, you know, five, ten years ago. Mm. It really started happening, or, you know, where, uh, you know, even the JSC, uh, you know, it's supposed to take de decisions that are very, mm. very, very robust and progressive, mm. you know. But when you started having appointees maybe coming from from the president, maybe the then president mm. who, or, or the current president, I don't know, who, mm. who were literally coming there to pursue an agenda of government, then it, it starts eroding mm. that independence, you know. So I, I think for me that, that, that's what happened. And also it used to be seamless. We used to know um, who qualifies for what position and mm. who doesn't, mm. who is in line and who is not. Like right now... It was when predictable. I, yeah, when I'm with you... Seniority was when, recognized. When I'm with you right now as, as, a, as an attorney, I know you are more senior than I am. Mm. And when, whenever there's a, an appointment to be made in the law profession, I would know that um, only if uh, Remo Robe doesn't take it, I'll take it. Mm. But if Remo Robe and myself are pitched in the same, and I know I'm less experienced, mm. and I take it. Mm -hmm. That that then becomes a problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying this to to criticize. Mm. I'm just saying this is how the judiciary has always uh, yeah. operated. So if if there was going to be a solution, it's a really a matter of look at what the legislation says and appoint uh, some form of commission, so, so for either a commission of inquiry or, or, or some kind of yeah. uh, investigation needs to be done. Yeah, with the current allegations, I think we, we really need to have a very um, independent commission to look into them. Mm. And they have to interview whoever they want to interview, be availed with whatever evidence. Have subpoena yeah, powers. And so, yeah, and then they make uh, whatever recommendations, the mm. findings, uh, and then we know that that will clean mm. our judiciary. Okay. Yes. If that doesn't happen, is there an alternative? Well, for as long as it doesn't happen, mm. I see us um, eroding and eroding mm. our, our the, 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 the standing that we have mm. as an independent judiciary. Mm. Um, Right now, whenever a judgment comes, you, you ask yourself, is it because, is it mm. because not? Mm. You know, and, and judges would have applied themselves, mm. but we still cast doubt on, mm. on the whole process. Yeah. You know, because it's not, as we always say, it has never been about it being done, mm. justice. Yeah. It has always been the perception around it. Yes, yes, know, it's always that, about that's, perception. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about the general problem that um, judgments are taking too long and they are not coming out on time because that's one other thing that the newspapers have been really going to town about that certain judges and we're not going to mention names yeah. never seem to deliver judgments yeah that's a time. that is something that really discourages uh, as practitioners it's, it's very discouraging but i'm, I'm happy that uh, um the, there has been a move towards ensuring that um, you know cases are dealt with mm. um, you know uh, quicker mm -hmm. and disposed of quicker. But we, we are now back because in the past few years we, we were a bit more mm. um, you know harsh towards the judges that were not delivering, mm. and there was a lot of talk about judges being put to um, to you know, two terms mm. on delivery of judgment. I think it's, it's six months or something like yeah, that. Yeah. There is even Three some, to six yeah, there's something that, that has been put mm. in place actually in, uh, in, in, in print. Mm. Yeah, I, I can't remember. Mm. But if it's not three, it's six months, yes. so depending on the kind yeah, of so case. That, those are the kind of interventions that we need. Mm. But I'll, I'll tell you, um, we are still struggling with that. Mm. And something needs to give. But you know, interestingly, I was just sharing with um, one of my colleagues that 
we are talking about judges here. Mm. Um, not delivering judgments on time. Some judges not delivering judgments on time. Mm. But the same goes for, for, for other aspects of, uh, of our business as mm. lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, right now you go to BRS, uh, how long does it take for the, the clearance certificate to come out? Mm -hmm. I'm sitting on transactions that were done in um, September. We still don't have uh, the clearance certificate. Mm. These are transactions between people. People yeah. are selling property to others. They yeah, want I'm money. experiencing that. Yeah, actually, uh, in, in yeah. two deals that I'm actually yeah. doing myself. Yeah, exactly. We've so, been stuck for about six weeks. Yeah, so you are sitting there. I, I have some from September mm. that are not yet out. Mm. So you can imagine the ones that I did in, in October. Mm. You can forget that we are going to go to Christmas mm. without the transactions registered. Mm. So it, it's a whole spectrum of issues. We, we talk more about mm. judges delivering judgment, but look at what actually happens there. In other parts look, of yeah, the civil yeah, service. Yeah, yeah, civil service. Look at what happens at this office. Sometimes and how can that backlog. happen when there's supposed to be a reset? Ex exactly. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's a, we, we just need to, to really ensure that we put resources to the top mm. also. Yeah. Yeah. When we, we talk about delivery of, of judgment and time, mm. we need to put mechanisms that ensure mm. that judges mm. do, do that. And we also have to in, put interventions in other uh, areas as well. Of, yeah. Throughout you know, the entire like, government service. Yeah, exactly. So. All right. As we head towards the end of our conversation, I want you to talk about um, prospects in terms of you as a brand, as Taboho Sebeho. Uh, what's the future hold? What if you have that crystal ball? Ten years, fifteen years, what can we expect? Um, well, my honest wish for myself mm. um, is that I want to retire early. I uh, I don't want to be rich. No, not at all. Um, you already are. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I'm done. I'm, yeah, no. I just don't, I just want to lead a comfortable retirement because I, I was sitting the other day with, with my wife and asking her, why are we here? Mm. Uh, she couldn't really give me a very clear answer. Mm. Why, why are we here? What are keep we yourself engaged because you're doing something you love. Yeah, what are we, what are we it's doing? It's a labor of love. What are we doing in this life? You know, that's the question I or was Or the asking. deeper philosophical yeah, question. Yeah, what are we doing here? We are in this world. What are we doing here as human beings? Mm. Are we here to work and work and work and work, then get sickly and then we die? Mm. Uh, you know, I, I felt that uh, we need to, to spend the better part of our days happier. Mm. Uh, you know, at least pursue happiness. Uh, give um, Part of the happiness that you can derive is traveling the world, mm. pursuing your passion, if you, you, you love the law, do it yeah, to yeah. the best mm -hmm. uh, that you can without necessarily thinking a whole lot about, about money. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, uh, the other thing also is for somebody like me, I, I'm, I'm a lover for, for, for vintage vehicles. I would like to own mm -hmm. uh, probably a 1935 um, vehicle and drive it around. So, <laughs> You know, maybe these are things I should be pursuing. Yeah, yeah. Going into those kind of shows and, and, and bidding for cars. And, yes, you yeah, know? yeah. So, yeah. So, it's, it's so, a, but from a professional point of view, I, I just want to see um, Sebeho Atenis having continuity, mm -hmm. you know, beyond me. Um, I would like to really see my, my law firm being taken over by, um, you know, younger. Some and, of your, yeah. your, your professional and, assistants. Yes, and and, and possibly me getting completely detached from it, mm -hmm. completely. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the brand itself, just, and then they will carry on with it mm. and, and make it their own. So that's, that for me is, is what I wish for. Yeah. In fact, that should be doable since you've already established systems, isn't it? Yes, and that, that's, that's part of the reasons why I mm. establish systems, yeah. to try and, um, you know, and then I can, you know, but, you don't, I, but retirement also has its downside if retirement means doing nothing. You need to keep yourself active as long as you are alive. No, absolutely. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, the kind of law that we are practicing now is not healthy. Mm. Uh, where you consult, have five consultations a day, mm. draft documents and sleep at, at, at 11 o'clock because you are drafting or wake up at very, very early in the morning because you are doing a contract. 
But maybe the kind of practice that we should be engaging in as we grow older mm. is to have just one file that you're yeah. doing in a month. Mm. Yes. Uh, oh, and, oh. And, and doing a very good job, mm. but getting well paid for it. Or do what I do, have yeah. one case uh, or two cases a year. Exactly. So <laughs> maybe you know that's where I'm going. Yeah. Yes, yes. yeah. All right. This is a time now where you can hit me with a question if you have one for me. Well, I first wanted to find out how you are fusing the law practice with business. Mm. And second, secondly, what your take about uh, investment in shares mm -hmm. and how they have performed over the past vis-a-vis -vis real estate. Okay. Mm. These are tough questions. I, I don't think I, 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 I'm, I'm too conscious about it. Um, obviously, I know the two main areas where I, I have the greatest fun, uh, which is within the scope of entrepreneurship. So my approach is um, to delegate as much as possible to my managers and to have them run things on a day-to-day. -day. I only come in as a troubleshooter, firefighter, even when. For the most part, I've delegated responsibility to them. So that is how I'm able to run you know, up to 11 or 12 companies now without, uh, without too much concern, although uh, I've noticed that once a week there has to be a crisis. <laughs> yeah. So I've, I've come to accommodate crisis as part of the, uh, the package. Yeah. So that's the first part of the question. The second one was in regard to um, shares. Yes, vis -vis I'm, real estate. Yeah, I'm, I'm very passionate about, about the stock market. I, um, I have a company called Itara, which is short for Itara mm -hmm. I don't know whether you are aware of it when yeah. we used to work together. Yeah. That company does nothing else but stock market investments. Mm. So I make sure that there's a percentage of whatever income I make that comes uh, into the stock market, um, mainly in the local market. Mm. And there's been a lot of stagnation the last five to seven years, especially, I would say, the last five years. But before that, the stock market in Botswana was the best, one of the best performing stock markets among emerging markets. So when we were positioned, um, well positioned in the stock market, you can do a lot of things. Mm. So if I was to reveal a little secret, how I was able to, for instance, build uh, the plaza was in part because of liquidating some of the shares that I had invested earlier. So I believe that um, you should think more as investing in businesses than in shares. If you think like that, which is a, a mindset of mm, somebody like yeah. Warren Buffett, yeah. where you take those businesses, you analyze them, and you invest them as individual businesses. Mm. Um, if you do that, you have that mindset, you can't go wrong investing in shares. But I happen to be in love with both property and stocks. Mm. So, you know, and in a sense, property has has, has been a dominant mm. over stocks. But I would, anybody listening, anybody asking the question you've asked, I'll say, if you have an opportunity, if you do your homework, the important part is to do your homework. Mm. And I have a four point criteria, which you can't discuss now, yeah. as to when to invest. If you do your homework and you've read, you've read, you should also invest in stocks. If for any other, if for no other reason, as part of a diversification strategy. Yeah, I hope I've answered your question. No, you have. You have. Actually, um, the, the point of interest that I, I'm picking, which I've been debating on, mm. is um, investing in the business mm. or investing in the stocks. Mm, mm. You know, and I find investing in business to be more um, profitable. Yeah. Uh, of, although the risk is there. Yeah. But over the past... Um, five, ten years, like you say, mm. um, I've seen, no, seven actually. Yeah, stock uh, yeah, market has yeah, you know, yeah. done very badly. I mean, mm. the investment that I put there, mm. uh, I even regretted mm. at some point. But, but have you but, noticed that yeah, this year it's speaking. beginning to pick up yeah. again? Yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, if you are in it for the long haul, yeah. and if you are not under pressure, yeah. for instance, you don't need the money to pay school fees next mm. year, Yeah. please get into stocks. Yeah. You will never regret it. I haven't regretted it. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, that camera is yours for you to um, take a look at that viewer, you know, look them in the eye and leave them with 
something inspirational, something uplifting, uh, sort of a summary of what we covered, as yeah. it were. Mm. Well, um, thank you for having me. Um, to the viewers out there, I would say to you that um, please pursue your passion. Whenever you do something, do it because you love it. And hard work has no substitute. Hard work and planning has no substitute. Somebody was saying, planning, um, failing to plan is planning to fail. <laughs> so at any given time when you are undertaking uh, an initiative, please plan, draw up a plan and do your projections. Once you have that in place and you've answered and debated on it, then you can start on it. It doesn't matter what it is, uh, whether it's you building a one-room ho one house at, at uh, your Maraca or undertaking whatever activity that you, you want to, to, to undertake. You need to plan and you need to stick to your plan once you've, you've uh, um, you know, crystallized it. So good luck with whatever endeavors you are, you are undertaking. Uh, you've been a great guest, sir. But as we conclude, please share all your contacts with the viewers. Um, Sebeho Atenis, uh, partners at Sebeho Atenis dot co dot bw, or Deboho at Sebeho Atenis dot co dot bw, landline 3906 311, or you can always contact us on Facebook, Sebeho Atenis, um, or even in our website, you know, we, we, we are reachable. So if you want to contact me on my mobile, 741-44444, 741-44444. My line is just a business line, so you can always reach me out. Okay. Yeah. You've done a great job, sir. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing much. so generously. You did a good job. Yeah. Cheers.